Well, we continue our series of the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. A few years ago, probably more than that, my mind is not what it used to be, so probably a lot more years than I think it is. Basketball player Charles Barkley said that you shouldn't look to him to be your, for your kids to have, be their hero. Uh, they should look at dads, and they should look at other places. Got me to thinking, and I kind of looked up the... the and so I'm not fasting yet, yet on the phone because I'm going to use it this morning for, for church, okay? It's official. Well, I got till 6 p.m. There's a free-for-all, okay? Go home and get it. No, no. This is what it says about a hero. A person who is admired or idolized for courage, outstanding achievement, or noble qualities. A war hero. Man, that describes Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He was in his war of life and death. He won. And so because he won, we win. We celebrate that in a couple weeks. Resurrection Sunday. This is a great, wonderful time for for Christians uh, because it's a celebration of what Jesus did on the cross. I know you may sit there and go, how's that a celebration? He died because of his death. We, because he was resurrected, we also have defeated death. You know, you think about Hollywood and a Hollywood ending, you know, the hero gets the girl, rides off into the sunset, and everything goes wonderful. You know, that's just, but here's just a reminder. Hollywood is not life. Amen? Everything doesn't end with a happy ending. And so, but if you think about it, if anybody here, if anybody really deserves the title of hero, wouldn't it be Jesus Christ? He came and he conquered death for his people. And this morning we're going to look at just a, a few short words that Jesus said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is God. I can't remember the the theologian that said it. It's kind of basically, it's God turning his back on God. Because Jesus Christ took on the sins of the world. And we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to look at some scriptures over in in Mark this morning. Uh, Mark chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Mark 15. We'll look at verses 33 through 39. But you know what? Jesus didn't have a leading man. I guess you would say he was the, the leading man. Uh, he was selfless. He didn't have, at that time, really he had a, just a small group of followers. Uh, you know, uh, we know the Bible te- te- teaches us that Jesus wasn't some super good looking guy that made all the, everybody just flock to him. No, he just, there was nothing special about him. The way that he looked, it talks about that over in Isaiah 53. He didn't have the, you know, the great good looks and everything. But, but yet, he's a great hero. Uh, I think probably the greatest hero on the face of the earth. Uh, for, as us for believers, and we're not, into, we're not into hero worship, but we're into the worship of our Lord, right? There's a, there's a difference there. And yet, what Jesus did is he came here and he faced, if you will, his greatest enemy, Satan. Satan's here. We go all the way back to Genesis. We see all the way through Scripture, Satan has been here and, and causing havoc and causing problems. But ultimately, Jesus overcame that. He lived a sinless life, perfectly keeping the law of God because no one else could. Then he was rejected by his own people. Those people that he came to save, he was rejected by. And he's rejected by people today, to this day. You can go to start to talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, do you know the Lord? I don't need to hear about that. There's still that rejection going on today. But he came to offer the way of salvation for you and I. He, he, come, he had to die. He had to be nailed to a cross and executed. The innocent dying for the guilty. Man, that seems harsh, doesn't it? That seems extreme, doesn't it? It is extreme. But that's how much God loves you. We just sang about it. For God so loved the world. And we're part of that world. Jesus was rejected by the Jews. He was accused of blasphemy. He was, he was declared worthy of dying on a cross. They beat him. They bound him. They turned him over to Pilate. Pilate refused to, to uh, free Jesus, and he upheld the death sentence, turning Jesus over to the soldiers who could execute him. The soldiers took Jesus. They mocked him. They scourged him. And then they brought him to a place called Calvary where they nailed him to the cross. By the time we get to our text this morning in verse 33, 
Jesus had been on the cross for three hours. Three hours. During those first three hours, he suffered all kinds of pain that the cross could pour out on him. He was mocked. He was mocked by the crowds. The first three hours were a time of pain and being degraded and shame. During that time, he was He was humiliated. This is the creator of all creation. We know it talks about in John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with with God. And the Word was God. He created everything. And His people are mocking Him. And they are crucifying. They want Him to die. Think back, you know, when when it came before Pilate, and they, they wanted Him to release Him. Crucify! 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 That's what they wanted for Jesus. This is God who made it all. And that's what mankind says. And do we do any different today, really? We may not say, crucify you, Lord. But do we live the way that we should live? It's a question for us. The God who made man out of dust was dying for sin on the cross right behind him. And they had no more compassion for him than they have when maybe an animal is killed in the road. Up to that point, Jesus has suffered greatly at the hands of man. Now it's time for him to suffer at the hands of his heavenly Father. Do you hear me? Now it's time for him to suffer at the hands of the Father. The cross was not about man having his chance to attack God. The cross was about God judging his son for sin in the place of sinners. See, that's why he died on the cross. This morning we're looking at the death of, his, of the servant's suffering servant. In this passage we'll see Jesus as he suffers for sin on the cross. Our sin. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. My sin put him there. We need to think about that. We need to really understand and ponder. And we've talked about this, and I'm not making light of it. We don't see sin the way God sees sin. It's repulsive to God. God is a holy God. He allows no, there's no sin allowed into heaven. We're sinful. We have a sinful nature. I know we want to say, well, I'm not that bad. You may not be that bad compared to Bob or Pete or whoever somebody else is, but you know what? You're a sinner. Guilty before a holy God. All the way back to the garden. And then we just add on it as we live, don't we? As you think about it. We are sinners. And it just, it seems, it seems like, I know I've talked to my daughter about this and one of her friends, and there's a movie, Batman, and and one of the characters is, is the, the knight, in, or not the knight in shining armor, but he's the, the DA, and he's the, he's the hope of everything. Harvey Dent, he's going he's gonna to make it all happen. It's going to be great. They push Harvey Dent just far enough, just, just enough. The Joker does, and what happens? He becomes two-faced, and he becomes evil. That's us, guys. If somebody pushes us just far enough, our sin would come out. You might sit there and go, never happened, Pastor Bill. I don't want to say, yeah, it would, because I don't want to see it happen to you, but I believe it would for all of us, because it's the nature. How many of you have had to teach your grandkids or your kids to be bad? Comes natural, doesn't it? Comes natural. So open your Bibles. Mark chapter 15. Let's pick up here in verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, probably around noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Wow. The misery of Jesus' death. As I said before, as we come to this verse, Jesus has probably been on the cross about three hours. Nails have been driven through his hands and his feet. The nails passing through his hands would come in close proximity to the nerves. That would have created some pain, spasms of pain that would have shot throughout his body. The muscles of his body would be cramping from dehydration and from the force of being 
to remain in an unnatural position on the cross. Remember, he was beaten. He was beaten and scourged, meaning that the, the whip had, had glass and rock at the end of it, and it was ripping out flesh. Somebody told me the other day, and I don't remember who it was now. If it was you, I apologize. But they said in the, in the filming of one of the movies where Jesus is portrayed being beaten like this, the person that was there, the actor that was there, the whip got away and actually ripped out some of the flesh on his body. And he said it was one of the most excruciating things ever. Jesus, it was said, I believe it in Isaiah, that he was beaten beyond recognition. So he's been beaten, he's been scourged, his body's been ripped apart. This, this crown of thorns is into his head. He's been crucified on this cross. And he's laying there in this unnatural position for three hours. Man, I get a sliver and it's bad news. You know, I start calling Lori, Lori. Not really. But we think about it. Muscles cramping. The spasms in the body would, would have caused his back, which was lacerated from scourgings, to ride up on that wood. The thirst, the fatigue. And I can only imagine what he had endured. And he endured it for you and I. By noon, the Lord's physical sufferings weren't even close to being over yet. You know what's coming next? His, his spiritual suffering. His spiritual sufferings will be worse than the physical sufferings that he's gone through. Well, how, Pastor Bill, how can that be? You talked about you, you, you just talked about him hanging on the cross because what's coming next is worse. We're told that there was total darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. After humanity has abused and shamed the Son of God, God the Father turned the lights out. This wasn't an eclipse. This was a natural darkness that God poured out. It doesn't seem as when you look at theologians that this was worldwide. This was isolated here. So why did, why did God cause all this darkness to fall upon Israel? There's a few possibilities. One reason has to do with the people around the cross. For three hours they had laughed, they had mocked, they had stared at Jesus as he hung on the, on, in nakedness and shame on the cross. Now God about to do about a, a dense darkness he brought this upon there he didn't want his son humiliated any longer christ was about to endure the sinfulness of humanity taking on him on put upon his body think about that the prophet maybe another reason was to fulfill prophecy the prophet amos warned of the coming judgment of god against the sinfulness of israel Amos chapter 8, verse 9. And it shall come to pass that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the earth on a clear day. God caused it. Exodus 10, 21-23. God sent darkness upon the land of Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped a god named Moriah. The sun god. God extinguished that power. When the darkness fell on Israel that day, God was signaling the judges, judgment of the nation of Israel was at hand. The darkness that covered Israel lasted for three hours. Have you ever been somewhere when it's pitch black? Darkness kind of shuts life down, doesn't it? If you can't even see your hand in front of your face, what are you going to do? For three hours, there was little sound or movement. At the end of time, from the depths of the oppressed darkness, Jesus cries out, My God, my God! Why have you forsaken me? To understand why Jesus made that terrible cry, we need to understand what was happening during those hours of darkness while Jesus hung on the cross that day. The sins of those who would be saved were transferred to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When darkness covered the nation of Israel that day, the blessed Lord was plunged into the greatest darkness that he had ever known. Jesus took on the darkness of sin. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2.24, 2, Who has his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin 
should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. Consider what that means. It means that every lie, every murder, every act of revenge, every aborted baby, every word of blasphemy, every evil deed committed by those who would be redeemed by his blood were placed on Jesus. Jesus is sinless. He's never sinned. And now all the sin is piling on him. It means that all the pride, all the hatred, all the sexual sin, the immorality, all the wickedness, the ungodliness of his people were placed on him. It means that every rape, every molestation, every injustice, every evil thought or deed committed by those who would be redeemed by Jesus were put upon him. Can you imagine how he must have felt never having sinned in his life? He's perfect, he's holy, and now all the sin of the world upon him. Maybe we think about our sins that were poured upon him. Maybe we struggle. Maybe there's something you struggle with. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's road rage. Maybe it's fill in the blank. It's sin to God. And that piled on Jesus 2,000 years ago. As he's laying there, you know who he's thinking of? All of us. Because he's paying for us, he's paying the price for our sin. His bride, us, the bride's sin was placed on him. The spiritual agony that Jesus must have endured outweighed the physical torment that he had gone through. When this transaction on the cross, God focused all of his wrath against the sin that's on, the body of, on, his, on his son's body. God judged him, judged him as, if he were, as if he were one of those who would come to Christ. He judged Jesus for my sin. God treated Jesus as if he was a murderer, a rapist, a liar, a blasphemer. In that moment, Jesus suffering the greatest agony of hell itself. He suffered separation from the presence of the Father. This has never happened. He had been with the Father in that presence forever. And by the way, the greatest pains of hell and fire for you will, will not be a fire for those who go there. It will be the separation from God. We have a relationship with God. Amen? And if that's truly what it is. It's a relationship. It's not religion. You know what religion is? It's man's attempt to get right with God. The relationship is about Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then we have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. God speaks to us. He guides us. He leads us. He gives us wisdom. He provides for us. I mean, the list goes on and on. In this relationship, we are looked at as his chosen children. Amen? I mean, we are chosen by God. When you say yes to Jesus, when you trust him as your Lord and Savior, when you give control of your life, when you repent of your sins, when you turn to Jesus Christ to pay the price, which is what he's done right there, which is what we're talking about this morning. Oh. But the greatest agony, ag agony that Jesus was enduring was separation from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people thought he, on the cross there was a, a, a legend that Elijah would come and, and take care of the Jews that were suffering. And they were, we, saw, we read there, they were looking to see if Elijah was going to come and take Jesus down from the cross. But Jesus was, was basically quoting Philippians, or Psalms 22. And then Mark says in verse 37, he cried with a loud voice and he gave up his ghost. John tells us he cried in, in verse 19, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished in Greek. Is basically it was a, a, a common statement, but it was when, it was, when there was a, a, an agreement between two people, it was basically said, it is finished. It is done. And so this transaction, if you will, of God towards the sin of the world, he's put it on his son, and his son has paid it, and now his son says, it is finished. Because he's taken it on, and he gave up his ghost. When Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross to satisfy God. Jesus didn't die to pay the devil. Jesus died because the wages of sin is death. Jesus died because the only way he could ever 
we could ever be free from and innocent was that somebody had to pay for the sin. That's just exactly what Jesus did. He took our sin upon him and he was judged in our place. He died when he knew the Father was satisfied. He's a propitiation of, 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 for our sins. The death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary was the ultimate expression of God's love for the lost. He sent his son to die in our place. Jesus died physically, spiritually. He did it not because we deserved it. He did it because he loved us. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He suffered for those that he loved. Number two, there were some miracles that happened. The miracles at Jesus' death. Look at verse 38. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw in this way, he breathed his last. He said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, or James, the younger. When he was in, so there's some ladies there, the centurion. Imagine the earthquake, the rocks scattered, the graves burst open, it talks about in, in, in Scripture. Man, there, there's some things going on. Powerful earthquakes. Matthew 27, 51 to 53. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared. Imagine that, seeing earthquakes and rocks. And the, the, the veil in the temple has been ripped. It had been said that the veil in the temple was so thick that a team of horses couldn't rip it. And now it's been ripped from the top to the bottom. The miracle. The veil in the temple was, was hung between the holy, holy place and the holy of holies. And according to the law, the high priest could only go behind the veil, and he could only go there one time each year. God promised Israel that he would dwell between the two cherubim and that he would st stand over the mercy seat. He promised that he would meet with his people on the day of atonement. The high priest was to take the blood of the lamb, enter the holy of holies. He was to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat which rested on top of the Ark of the Covenant, making atonement for the sins of the people. To enter the Holy of Holies at one time and without blood is a violation. It was a death sentence. And now that has been ripped open. Do you see the significance? Because what's been ripped open is now we have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ as our sins are paid for. He paid the price. He was the atonement. That's why Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is such a celebration. We say Good Friday. Why is it good? Because it's good for us because Jesus paid it all. Do we start to get the picture and start to see and start to understand why Jesus said, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I said it earlier. The theologian said, God, turning his back on God. Jesus took on the sins of the world. God wouldn't look upon him because of the sin. He paid the price for you and me. Oh. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Wow. The moment Jesus, Jesus died. Wow. Think about it. Jesus, was a, Jesus gave up his life. The Jews didn't take it. Satan didn't take it. Jesus gave it up. And look, if you think about it, right when, when God the Father was satisfied with the price that he had paid for our sins, he gave up his breath. He was gone. He died. Good Friday. But Sunday's coming, amen. Sunday's coming, amen. Mm. 
There were some other miracles ministry that went on there. You know, we talked about the centurion there. He was a, over 100 Roman soldiers. Probably this man had seen many executions, many, many crucifixions. He had seen many men die. But he sees and understands that when Jesus died, because most who died on the cross probably said basically in their mind, if you had been crucified and you were hanging on that cross for, for hours, days, you know, pretty much you'd come to the point of being insane because of the pain and everything. He saw that Jesus was still in control of his faculties. And he gave up his life when God the Father was satisfied with the price that was paid for sin and not till then. Again, the Jews didn't crucify him. The Gentiles didn't crucify him. The Romans didn't crucify him. Satan didn't do it. Well, they did the act, but they didn't kill him. He gave up his ghost to pay the price for us. For us. And so when we see that, and we talk about all that we've talked about this morning, do we see and understand what Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hmm. Leads to action steps. Why did Jesus do what he did? I mean, I look around. You guys are wonderful people. But I look around and see people in the world, and it's like, why did he die for us? Why does God love us? You ever ask yourself that question? Why does God love you? I mean, some of you I know. Eh, you know, I know you're like going, yeah, well, right back at you. He did it. You know why he did it? He did it so that sinners would be saved. He did it so that we might, might be, there might be power in the gospel. He did it so that those who have trusted Jesus would have hope. He did it to save us. Hear what Paul said about the death of Jesus. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. Romans 4.25, who was also delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Bottom line, guys, the question today is, what does the death of Jesus Christ mean for you? I'm just going to get pointed. Are you saved? Are you in a right relationship with Jesus Christ right now? Because if you're not, if those at home are wa watching on YouTube this morning, if you're not right with Jesus, today's the day of salvation. For all of us in here, we need to get right with God now. You know, we can get talk about eschatology and end times and, well, this is coming. You know what? It doesn't matter. None of us know how many days we have. That word saved is a church word. We talk about it. We use it. Saved. Saved from what? Saved from eternal damnation in hell. From eternal separation from God. My encouragement to you, if you're not saved, see me, see Pastor J.W., see Mike Turk after church, because we need to talk. We need to help you understand. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. I shared a question. I've shared this question with you before. And it's a question that I was asked when I had the pastor come, and he's talking to me, and he's sharing about Jesus. And uh, he made this statement to me. If I stood before God tonight... And God said to me, why do I let you into my heaven? How did I, would I respond? I ask you the same question. You're standing before God and he says, why do I let you into my heaven? How do we respond? Let's pray.